Coming up on this episode of the Hockey Nuts, Steve and I get you caught up with all the news of the past week around the hockey world. The Stanley Cup Final continued this week with the Capitals and Golden Knights battling hard for the right to take home hockey's holy grail. Steve and I will get you caught up with everything that's happened in the series. We'll have all the details of all this, plus the Minor League Hockey Minute and our picks of the week coming up next. This is the Hockey Nuts Podcast, Season 2, Episode 40, recorded on Thursday, June 7th, 2018, NHL Stanley Cup Final Review. Shut up and sit down. So another face-off. In the attacking zone for the Golden Knights, and Howla's down to try and take it. Beagle against him, won it back. Into the corner, the battle's on. Carlson just got carried. Orpik up the boards. They'll fight to get the puck to the line. Riley Smith kept it in, and the Capitals have won game number two. They held off a determined Golden Knight team to win 3-2, to two, even the series. complete one last whistle with nine seconds to go an efficient night for Braden Holpe swollen goalposts behind him and Mum doesn't have to worry about being nervous right now no. the Washington Capitals are going to Vegas one win away from the Stanley Cup and Orpik and Kuznetsov and Niskanen are the Capitals in front of Holpe. Off the face-off tie-up, it came to the corner, down to the ice goes Neal. Meanwhile, it is tucked. Down to the last 20 seconds. Neal around behind with it now. Goes to the corner, continues closed off there by Niskanen, puck to the side, and it's Marcheseau on a cross. Held there by Chuck, given back to Marcheseau. Fed one to the slot, challenged there by Kuznetsov, and down went Smith. Taken on by Eller. Eller able to lift one back down the ice, and it is wide. They hurry back down to get the icing, which they do. Six tenths of a second. They will double check the clock to make sure that that is accurate. If you're William Carlson, what do you do? I think you're David Perron. You take the face off and try to go forward with it. Now Carlson backs out and Perron will step in to take it. Got to try to shoot it towards the net. Off the face off the Capitals and won it! The capital of the country is the capital of the hockey playoffs. They rush out onto the ice to congratulate Braden Holpe. The Washington Capitals, for the first time in their 44-year history, are the Stanley Cup champions. (laughs) 
Hello and welcome to the Hockey Nuts Season 2, Episode 40 of the Hockey Nuts Podcast. How's it going today, Steve? It's going good, Wayne. How you doing? Good to be with you. Good. Looking Back. forward to a great podcast together. Back for one more week. We're at uh, Episode 40 for this season, 85 overall, so... Uh, we're getting up there, and things are beginning to wind down here a little bit uh, around the NHL. Um, we are sitting at elimination games from here on out for the, yes. for the Stanley Cup playoffs. Yes, we are. I thought we'd get up to the Sidney Crosby episode, but uh, I'm not going to make it, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. No, nope. in, 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 instead, we're stuck at the Peter Klima episode. How's that for a throwback <laughs> name, huh? <laughs> that's a that's a good one. That's a that's a name that haunts me as a Bruins fan. <laughs> yeah, Nordiques, wasn't he? Peter uh, no, well, the 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 reason he haunts me is uh, he was playing for the Oilers back in 1990, and uh, he scored a goal in triple overtime of the uh, Stanley Cup Final, uh, Game One, and uh, that sent Edmonton off onto their uh what was it their fifth fourth stanley fourth cup fourth or fifth stanley cup no, yeah that was after gretzky was gone yeah i knew i remembered him from somewhere as a, yep. in a canadian team so yeah yes. Bruin, bruins fans can, can are with me in that one that, that if they ever have to hear peter klima's name again <laughs> it'll be too soon so <laughs> that was a very very good one wayne way to open the show <laughs> but that was his that was his number i remember that for sure <laughs> 85 all right so Enough about uh, Peter Klima, because <laughs> it's been a long time since he's played. We've <laughs> got to talk about uh, everything going on in the Stanley Cup Final. We recorded uh, a week plus a day ago, and uh, we've had three games since then, and all three games have gone to Washington. So now yes. we are sitting at a 3-1 to one lead uh, for the Washington Capitals in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And certainly, uh, I know you would agree with me that uh, it, even though it is a 3-1 lead for Washington, the games uh, I, I have been fantastic. I mean, I've been thoroughly Absolutely. entertained by these games. Absolutely. This I, has been a very entertaining Cup Final. I don't. Uh, I don't envy anybody who's a diehard Capitals or uh, Vegas Golden Knights fan, though, because um, <laughs> they're probably having heart attacks every every few minutes during those games. But as as a, as a guy who doesn't really have a dog in the fight, I can sit back yeah. and enjoy it for what it is. It's been a fantastic series so far. I hope it continues tonight. Uh, yes. Game, game five is tonight, and I know you're rooting for a, a game five win for Vegas, as am I. Uh, I yes. want to see this. I want to see this series go the distance because these two teams have been putting on a show. Oh, absolutely! Great goaltending on both sides. Great uh, skating, wouldn't you say, Wayne? A lot Tremendous of speed. skating. Tons of speed. Yep. Uh, in fact, we're going to start seeing copycats around the NHL. I think from this, it is a copycat league, and and the teams yep. that tend to make it all the way to the final, um, they get emulated in the following season. So I, yep. it makes me look forward to next season. Uh, you have a fast skating teams, both of them uh, physical. The games have been very physical. Um, oh yeah. I mean, both teams, hey. both teams have been leaving it on the ice, and um, you know, for for. Uh, you know, just the way it's the way it's turned out right now, Washington has the three-one uh, leads because they split the two games in Vegas, and then the last two games were in Washington. Washington just uh, held serve at home on, in those games. So we go back to Game Five. Uh, game Five is um, in Vegas, as is yeah. Game Seven. So Vegas fans, uh, you should feel, I know a lot of them are feeling defeated right now because they're down three to one, but there's three games remaining in the series. As long as they keep winning, absolutely. Uh, two of those three games are in Vegas, right? Where they and have shown that they are, uh, formidable. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, they're the, the capitals found a way to win one game, but, um, uh, it took a monster effort by, uh, Braden Holpe in that game. And it took a monster effort from the whole capitals team. And that's an effort that, uh, will be difficult to, to repeat. So, you, you um, know, you know, so Wayne, I'm not counting out Vegas in, in any stretch yet. No, and and you know we talked we talked about this before this the, the we put press record on the on this podcast, and you, you know I think it's important. Rarely do I recall in previous um, Cup finals where I've really thought about the strategy involved from here on out from a game five on out in the series. As I have in this one, um, with a three to one Capitals lead, 
That's not by no means are they secure. I don't feel that at least anyways. I, I think you kind of touched on it when before we started in that if if uh, Washington lets up tonight, they're in big trouble. Yep. Uh, they, they cannot afford to say, oh, th- throw in the towel or, or, or drop back and punt in this game. Uh, th- they Because then they really will have pressure on them. And I don't know if they have a tremendous amount of pressure tonight, but I think if you if you took the two teams – the teams with the pressure, the team with the pressure on them tonight is definitely the Washington Capitals. Absolutely. Now, Barry Trotz is, should be very used to that, especially in big games. Um, he has a tremendous amount of pressure built up on him over the years, which I'm sure he's let go a lot of that this year. But they can't afford to let up at all. They have to keep their foot mashed down on the accelerator as much as they possibly can tonight, because if they lose this game tonight, or get or throw in the towel, you know. As you've seen, you've seen that happen in previous. Yeah, I've seen it happen the Stanley oh, yeah. Cup before. I've a seen it happen throws, earlier this year. <laughs> absolutely, you can, you've seen teams throw in the towel, and they figure, well, we, we got the lead, we'll just come back and get them. In. But you see, then Tampa Washington, Bay did, Tampa Bay did that in Washington. Game you know Bay. what? That's true. Yeah, and it cost them the series. Yep. Um, man, that's a great point, Wayne. Yep. But you know, if they lose, then Washington has to win at home because I think you and I are agreement in agreement. If it goes to Game Seven in Vegas, this thing is over, and I think the Vegas Golden Knights are the Stanley Cup champions. I really do. If they get to Game Seven, they're going to win it. They get to Game Seven. That's when you're going to see Washington will no pre- at this point. There's no pressure on the Vegas Golden Knights for the rest yep. of the series. It right. is. It is. They're. Pe- I mean, to to use a, 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 a you know not to use a uh, gambling term, but they're playing with house money at this point. Absolutely. So they can just go out there, leave it all on the ice, give it their absolute maximum effort, and that way, if they do in fact lose, they they'll know that they you know they gave it all they had. Um, they you know they they they, they got nothing to lose at this point. Um, right now, the pressure, like you said, is 100% on Washington to close this thing out. Yep. And if they do, in fact, lose tonight, yep. um, which is very likely, Vegas has been very strong at home thus far uh, during the playoffs. Yeah, Washington's got that one win, but um, you know it wasn't easy. And and I would even say Washington was fortunate to get out of there with a win. Yep. Um, Vegas could very easily win this game tonight, send it back to Washington. Then you know the 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 Capitals are are going to be coming in into their home rink with all the pressure to try to win it at home. Um, they're going to be holding the sticks a little tighter. You know, every, you know everything gets you know a little bit more tense for them. Right. Meanwhile, right. meanwhile Vegas can continue to play loose as a goose and and they can just you know run right through them three straight. I you know it's only happened once in the Stanley Cup Final in history where a team has come back from a three games to one uh, uh, deficit. It's it's something in the in the neighborhood of thirty two and one, thirty six and one. Something like that, where a team has taken a three one lead and only one time out of thirty five or so seasons, uh, or thirty five or so times in in all of history, has has a team come back from a three one in the Stanley Cup final and come back and uh, win the series. But in this case, it could absolutely happen. Oh, I I very easily. Um, tonight's game is uh, it's not a must win for Washington. I, I feel like this. If Washington is dumb enough to do what Tampa Bay did just, just earlier, what you just said, absolutely true. Tampa Bay threw in the towel. If they're dumb enough to do that, I, I, I could even say that the series might be over. But um, And Vegas wins it. But if, if they hang in there and they fight to the very end, it's a one-goal game, and they give it their all, they can get on the plane and go home at least and say, you know what, we gave it our all. We didn't let it up on the ice. We fought tooth and nail to win the Stanley Cup tonight, and they can feel good about that going home. Yep. Um, yeah, it hurts to lose a one goal game uh, when you're trying to win the Stanley Cup. But and 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 I'm t- I'm telling you as a New York Rangers fan because we were sitting here three years ago, four years ago, and I I can tell you I watched three overtime losses against the Los Angeles Kings. I know all about what it feels like. Yeah. So um, the the they it, it, Washington has to fight tonight, and they have to fight unlike maybe they've ever fought before because they're going up a, against a circus in Las Vegas. They really are. They're going up against things that no team has had to deal with uh, in terms of how Vegas has. They're 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 almost a wily veteran team with what they've done. But um, if if they do that, they come home really victors, and they and they can get on the ice in Washington. And I think I feel like put it behind them and, and win that game. 
so so that that's the challenge I think as I see it for them they they have to uh you know rely on uh what they've done all season what they put together how they've overcome the Pittsburgh Penguins that in and of itself was a tremendous victory for them um they have to that's what they have to do to force this thing uh, to the next step. And if, if, if they do enough, to, of course, to win the Stanley Cup, I'm sure they'll celebrate just as hard as they would in, had they won it in, in Washington. Although they, they probably want to win it in Washington, I think, but for the sake of their fans. But it, it doesn't matter. When you, you get to this close, you want to put it away and win that cup. So that, that's what my thoughts were on it. Yep. Yeah, and I would certainly agree with just about all of those points for sure. Um, you know, it like I said, I hope I hope it continues tonight. I want to see yeah. Vegas win. I want to see a game six. Um, yeah. And I really do enjoy um, if a team is going to win the Stanley Cup, I prefer that they win it at their home rink. So if we're gonna have um, if if Washington's ultimately win the cup, uh, are going to win the cup, I'd like to see it happen in game six. If Vegas ultimately wins the cup, I want to see it happen in Game Seven. Uh, I just, it's just much more enjoyable to watch the celebration because the fans are into it; they're part of the celebration. Everything else, whereas the visiting team wins the Stanley Cup, the arena empties out, and with the exception yeah. of the few hundred fans of the visiting team that happen to be in attendance, they kind of stick around. But it's a much smaller, much quieter celebration when. <laughs> when uh, the visiting team wins and, and, and I much prefer making it, you know, a whole big thing. Um, you know, where, whereas, you know, the whole, the whole home crowd getting into it would be, it's, it's, it's just more enjoyable that way. And, and, and I don't know about you, but I'm one of those that, you know, when I watch a, a sports team win a championship, I typically watch late into the night, as long as they continue to cover it, like we'll have to switch over to the NHL network at some point. NBC will only cover it. Yeah. Probably until um, the team picture at the very, you know, they'll cover this cup celebration. They'll cover, you know, the individual players raising the cup. But when they get when they get into the middle of the ice for that group team photo, that's when NBC is going to call it a night. And and then we'll have to switch over to the NHL oh, network. Oh, yeah. I, I cannot afford to do that, but I'm going to try and watch that whole game tonight and just go blurry eyed to work tomorrow. Uh, you know, and not care. Yeah. So, uh, but um, that that's you know we'll we'll see. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm I'm really kind of pumped, Wayne. It's it's a day to be uh, pumped for this. So I'm looking forward to it. Well, there's there's, there's games every third day. All these long pauses between games. It's, it's so much so. I went into work think this morning thinking that the next game was tomorrow night, not tonight. And uh, and yeah. I was reminded by a couple of Capitals fans that that I work with uh, that no, the game is in fact tonight. Not yeah. uh, tomorrow night. So, um, so yeah, we're gonna uh, we're gonna enjoy it for sure. The game starts at eight o'clock. Oh, here we are. It's it's. We still got several hours to go before we do that. We're we're in the middle of the afternoon recording this, so uh, we've got a ways to go before the game. But uh, I'm certainly gonna uh, sit down and enjoy it as as will you. Yes, sir. All right. Did you have anything else you want to talk about in terms of the Stanley Cup final? No, I think we we did it. We did it. We did it proper, Wayne. We, yeah, we didn't we, get into the nitty gritty of each team, but uh, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, you're probably watching the games anyway. There's really not a whole lot to describe. You know, we don't yeah. need to go through goal by goal telling you exactly what we saw, but because um, yeah. you, you know, those of you who are listening to us are watching the games, I guarantee it. Y'all know what it what took place, and y'all know, uh, you know, what you would agree that the hockey has been absolutely fantastic so far. It has been. It really uh, has. Goaltending alone is is just blowing me away. It seems like every game you, you you're seeing a save made by either Mark Andre Fleury or Braden Holtby, and you're like, they can't possibly do another save as good as that or better than that. And then it seems like at some point, either later in that game or in the next game, they top it with it. Even I mean, some of the some of the saves these guys are making are are absolutely incredible. So they really are. Um, all right, well, good. Let's move on then. Let's talk about some of the stories that have been going on around the league this week, and we're going to start with transactions. And we have uh, a transaction out of the island in New York that uh, is big news this week, kind of half expected with Lou Lamorello being hired as president of hockey operations, what a week or so ago, yeah. um, we open openly wondered what was going to happen with uh, certainly Garth snow and, uh, 
and even to a lesser extent, Doug Waite, the head coach. Well, as it turns out, this week, both were officially fired by the New York Islanders. Uh, Gar Snow was fired as general manager, and Doug Waite was fired as um, the head coach uh, on Tuesday. That was a couple of days ago. Uh, President of Hockey Operations, Lou Lamorello, will take over as the GM and begin the process of hiring a new coach. Uh, but kind of weird part of the story is Waite and Snow are actually going to continue with the organization in a different role. Um, Lamorello's quote earlier this week, he says, uh, they understand the decision that's made. I feel they can be valuable in me picking their brain, asking them their opinion on certain areas. As far as exactly what that role will be, the three of us have decided we'll determine that as we go along, but I'm not going to be afraid to reach out with them. I've already uh, done that. Uh, that's the way we'll proceed. So, Kind of weird that you're going to go ahead and fire these guys, but then keep them in the organization. I don't know if they're going to kind of drop them down into hockey operations type jobs, scouts, yeah. player development. I mean, Garth Snow could, I don't know if he'd drop all the way down as being a goalie coach. <laughs> yeah. He was a goalie when he played. Yeah. What, what, what does this have to do, uh, do you feel in any way with the John Tavares situation? Huge part keep, of it. Keeping them on huge part of it yeah. i think they're more than they're letting on we'll put it that way yeah lamorello was downplaying that whole situation saying you know this this transaction has nothing to do with you know their negotiations with tavares i think it has everything to do with negotiations with john tavares well that's the first thing that struck me is they're they're not going because tavares uh that whole thing hasn't been decided yet i think i think in order for tavares to stay with the islanders i would not be surprised if um he has said to them behind closed doors. I don't want to continue with this organization with with the people that are you know running it. Yeah. So I mean it's pure speculation on my part, but you know this there, where there's smoke there's fire. We'll put it that way. Yeah. But I think uh, you know that they the Islanders right now look very desperate in, in trying to find do everything that they need to do get all their ducks in a row in order to get John Tavares signed. Right. And the more this stuff goes on there, the more I think they're ultimately going to get him signed before July 1st, which will basically make free agency really boring this summer. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's no big name players like Tavares on the market. So right. there's already going to be very little in terms of real big name blockbuster players on the market. Um, Tavares was by far the biggest name that's going to be available. So if he falls off the board, then uh, yeah, it's going to be... A, it's going to be a, a pretty quiet summer in terms of free agency. Right. I, uh, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I would see it as uh, the, the mystifying part is keeping Grant Garth Snow and Doug Waite on. Yeah, that's kind of weird. That, that part I don't understand uh, because I think this has everything to do with John Tavares. Um, but keeping them on is the part I don't understand. So – um, I don't know what, you know, it's going to be very interesting. Here we are, it's June the 7th and we haven't heard a peep out of New York. Uh, and, and we're getting ready to talk about another player, another big name player in a minute who's, who's letting it be known where he wants to stay, you see. Yep. Um, and, and that's not happening in, in, uh, in New York, uh, with, is with respect to the Islanders. So, and maybe that's the way they choose to do it. Maybe that, maybe they just say, look, we're not going to talk about this till the season is over or we're close to doing whatever we're going to do. And that just may be the way they handle it. But you would think in a city like New York, which is as media um, crazy as any city in the world, that, that you'd hear something. Um, and, and we're not, we're not hearing anything. Yeah. They're doing a good job of staying pretty quiet. And of course, you know, they've got the whole arena deal too that that they're continuing to work on as well. So just a lot of transition and just a lot of, you know, just uncertainty going on with the uh the New York Islanders. And of course there's also the the rumors coming out of Canada, probably Quebec, that are saying that the Islanders are getting ready to move. <laughs> yeah. But uh, a lot of those rumors, if you talk to anybody who knows any, you know, that's anywhere close to the um to the organization, that those are just flat out fabricated stories by um what's what's the term that that uh, Gary Bettman once used, he said, <clears throat> fabricated stories by uh cities and or media outlets of uh, you know, in particular cities that are trying to finagle a way to get a team to come to their city. Yeah. 
and just just creating rumors like the whole the whole Carolina thing. Lot lots and lots of rumors that Carolina was on the move, and most of those rumors originated out of Quebec City. So, right. and not the Carolinas. Right. That's a very good point. So you know the the, the Islanders, unless their whole arena situation uh, in the Belmont Park, uh, that whole development falls through completely um i don't i don't see the islanders going anywhere right. so yes yeah, just a matter of whether or not lamorello can can pull his strings and find his they don't call him loophole lou for for <laughs> for yeah. no reason to find a way to get it done with uh with Tavares yeah. before that team because if, if they lose Tavares for nothing that team is in for a pretty long i mean yeah they got some nice pieces there but yeah um, but to lose your number one guy yeah, your, your franchise player. It's like uh, that's gonna. It's like Roberto Luongo. You know, it's it'd be the same thing. Only this would be a devastating loss. That's gonna set them back years. Yeah, yeah. it's gonna set the Islanders back years because they're a good enough team with Tavares. They're a good enough team to make the playoffs. Yeah, they are. Uh, not as good as they were a few years ago, but yes, they are. Yeah. They are because they've lost a, a Poso. I don't think uh, they're Stanley Cup contenders by any stretch, but yeah. but they're certainly good enough to make the playoffs. They lose Tavares, they're not making the playoffs. Period. No, and not for a long time. Not for a while. No. So, so as far as uh player transactions, there really hasn't been anything that is cemented uh well, there's one player and we'll get to him in a second that actually has officially signed with a team. But as far as all the uh NHL players that are you know either either going to free agency this year or players there's you're seeing a lot of talks with players that will be going to free agency next year because yeah. as of July 1st those players that are going to be free agents next year are eligible to be um, re-signed immediately so teams will start working you're seeing more and more of this as time goes on whereas teams are starting to work on their established stars as soon as they're within or less than one year away from going to free agency under the terms of the CBA, they're allowed to re-sign these players or extend their contracts out. And that's why this year's free agent group is is rather weak because most of the teams that had players that were scheduled to go to free agency this summer uh, have all re-signed their players already. Right. Um, and Tavares is one of the few that has yet to uh, re-sign. So, I mean, they, the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning did it last year with Stamkos. They signed him right before he went to free agency. Um, you know, Connor McDavid signed, uh, Carey Price signed. I mean, the the list is long of of a group of players that that were going to head for free agency, but got got signed to extensions long before uh, they became free agents. So, with that in mind, is we're into that time of the year where I like to call the silly season, where you're hearing yep. all kinds of crazy rumors of which players are going where. I mean, I mean, you name it. I've I've heard Oliver Eggman Larson's name come up, Phil Kessel's name come up, several players from Carolina, um, Noah Hannafin, Justin Falk, uh, Jeff Skinner, uh, just to name a few here in Carolina that are reportedly being shopped around. Um, you got a whole, I mean, and I'm not going to really focus on any one of these stories because these are nothing more than just rumors and 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 you know hearsay at this point. But it, it's kind of entertaining though to see some of the things that are. That, that are being um, <laughs> thrown around. Yeah. Well, um, I haven't seen a tremendous amount of it uh, any more than any other season, Wayne. Yep. Um, but as I said, the, the John Tavares cloak over that whole thing is really amazing. Yeah. Um, particularly, you know, I mean, if it was in, if it was in, if John Tavares played for the Nashville Predators or um, if he played for the, uh, I'm picking, the Arizona Coyotes, may, you might not hear, you know, that that's a different situation in terms of the media in those cities. But New York City, you don't hear anything. It's really amazing. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of New York City, um, Kovalchuk is is another one of those names that you keep hearing about. He's begun talks with several teams. They haven't named any specific teams yet, although he has come out and has said that um, he wants to win. So look for Kovalchuk to end up playing for a team that is a potential Stanley Cup um, contender. Although some guys could, uh, you know, pick wrong. I mean, you got, uh, uh, who was the last big Russian name to come over from, from oh, Radulov. It's probably yeah. one of the more recent ones where he came over and, and wanted to win and picked. Well, he picked Montreal to start with, and I think he's down in Dallas now. Is he still there? Yeah. 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 So, 
and yeah. he hasn't had any playoff success as of yet. But uh, but yeah, Kovalchuk has come out and said that he is um, he wants to win. So I wouldn't look for him to go to a team that is in a rebuilding state at this point. Right. So now, question is, you know, he's he's also had you know glowing reviews of Lou Lamorello. So it makes you wonder. Okay, he loves Lou Lamorello, but he wants to win. So it doesn't look like he's going to the Islanders, despite yeah. the fact that Lam- Lamorello is there. <laughs> well, I mean, if they lose Tavares, Lamorello may say, look, I'll bring in Ilya Kovalchuk and we'll just start over. Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, problem with, the problem with, with Kovalchuk wanting to go to a contender team or a winning team or you know however you want to label it, the bottom line is a lot of those teams that are in that position of having a strong team and are considered Stanley Cup t- contenders, a lot of those teams are tight against the cap. Right. So how many of them can actually afford to spend money on uh, Kovalchuk unless he signs for a uh, you know a kind of a sweetheart deal, signs at a discounted rate in order to win? Right. That would be the only <laughs> possible um, outcome there. But uh, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. But Kovalchuk is certainly coming over. So even without Tavares in there, I think that would propel Kovalchuk as pro- one of the bigger prospects available or free agents available, don't you think? Uh, well, you know, um, it, it's it's either going to be Tavares or him. Yeah, so I guess we'll uh, see. Yeah. All right, uh, talk of another Russian who is uh, possibly coming back over to the U.S. Valerie Nikushkin um, could return to the NHL next season, according to a tweet from the Dallas Stars. A uh, quote from the uh, general manager, Jim Nill, said, uh, I think in the end Val's going to come back as a Dallas star here this year. So as you know, he played the last two seasons in the Continental Hockey League after playing for Dallas from 2013 through 2016. Uh, he has 64 points in 166 games, but he is only 23. So he's still very young. So the three seasons he did play was, what, years 18, 19, and 20. Mm-hmm. So he was extremely young when he played uh, for the Stars the first time around. Mm-hmm. He was picked 10th overall in the 2013 draft. If he does, in fact, come back, uh, that is going to be a nice addition for the Dallas Stars. Yeah, I'll well, agree. Uh, and we talked about that, actually, I think in last season's podcast about him coming back. I yeah, think I think... Was- I- I think when he decided to go back to Russia, we talked about it. So yeah, yeah. But they, you know, in in uh, Dallas, they've got a new coach um, in Jim Montgomery. They've got uh, um, you know a lot of good players already in their core. They got Radulov, you got Sagan, you got Jamie Ben. I mean, you, it's a pretty decent team. And right. Kushkin, the Kushkin could make that team uh, really good. Oh yes, it, it could put them over the top and put them into a uh, contender status for sure. Agreed. All right, uh, Rick Nash. Did you see this story? Yeah, I, uh, I, I did see. I did see it. Um, I mean, it, if you contrast this with the John Tavares situation, I think it's telling. Um, it, it really is. Uh, Rick Nash. Um, yeah, the story came wanting out to, wanting to remain a Bruin. Yep, Rick Nash came out this week that he and the Boston Bruins are resuming contract talks. Um, and will continue to talk before uh, Nash becomes a free agent on July 1st. Um, and, he, and that message came from Don Sweeney, and uh, he told that to the Boston Globe on Friday. So, um, so the Bruins have a little bit of cap space this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they've got room to sign him, even if they have to overpay him a little bit, because obviously mm-hmm. he'll be a, an unrestricted free agent. If they only sign him to that short one-year contract at a you know a steeper than what they probably should pay for him, um, he's certainly not the Rick Nash that uh, you know they had in him in uh, New York and uh, Columbus. He's not right. that Rick Nash, um, but the Bruins don't need him to be. I think he'll be a nice addition on the third line, um, you know, kind of like what he did the, it, towards the end of the season. So. Mm-hmm be a good depth player for them Um, because the Bruins are going to be losing a few guys here to free agency. Not any of their big name, their core group of players. No, nobody's leaving in that sense, Mm -hmm. but they've got a few unrestricted free agents that are going to be taken off. Uh, Brian Gianta is not probably not going to be back. 
Um, Riley Nash, <coughs> it looks as though there may not be room for him on the roster. Unless, of course, Rick Nash doesn't sign, then they may go and see if Riley Nash comes back. Uh, and there's a few other players that are going to be unrestricted free agents, but none of them are, you know, they're not Marchand, they're not Bergeron, they're not, you know, they're big name stud players. So, um, so yeah, I, I'd be okay with a Rick Nash signing provided the money's right and the term is short. Yeah. Because next season, several of their young players that they have now will be unrestricted free agents, and the Bruins are going to have going to have a very difficult time fitting those guys under the cap next year when all those uh, entry level deals are done right. for those guys. So for one more season, yeah, I'm okay with them adding Rick Nash. Why not? Right. I'm sure I'm sure Sweeney will come to a cap friendly deal. <laughs> for yeah, that one. I agree. All right, and the final transaction is an actual transaction, not rumor. Uh, Bogdan Keselovich Keselovich signed a one-year contract with the Florida Panthers on Friday. Financial terms were not disclosed, and I didn't go look it up on Cap Friendly to see what he paid, uh, what he's getting paid. Uh, the 28-year-old defenseman is a nine-year veteran of the Continental Hockey League. He has 16 assists in 44 games with CSKA Moscow in 27-18, and was selected to the KHL First All-Star Team. And he was also a uh, participant in the. Um, the Olympics, because the picture that led this or that uh, this story came from uh, actually shows him in his Olympic uniform. So that's oh, how I know he actually played. <laughs> so um, Panthers taking a bit of a chance here on a Russian player yeah. that has not played here in the States um, thus far. I mean, he's been playing nine years over there, but right. he's a fr- but he's on the first all star team for the KHL. So the KHL recognizes him as being one of the best uh, defenseman in the KHL. And of course, um, Florida needs to, to get a little bit more depth on their defense. So why not give it, give a ch- chance like, uh, you know, a guy like him. Um, I'm sure he's thrilled. Oh yeah. Cause he's going to live in his January's and February's in Moscow to live in them in, in Miami. <laughs> That's got to make a guy happy. <laughs> if you like warm weather, it does. Yeah. So, yeah, that was the only signing that I've seen uh, thus far this week, yeah. or, or actual signing, because, you know, all all eyes are on the uh, Stanley Cup final at this point. All right. Once again this week, I had no injuries or suspensions or fines. Um, obviously, we know there are injuries with the Capitals and the Golden Knights. Um, they're just not talking about them. Right. They're keeping everything under wraps at this point. And as soon as the series is over, we're going to find out that half half the team on both teams are all got injuries that they've been <laughs> nursing. <laughs> all right, that puts us down into some of the other interesting stories we had going on around the league this week. And the first one I've got is I wanted to talk about the Washington Capitals and their fans. I don't know if you remember uh, watching game one. And, of course, game one was in Vegas and seeing the, um, you know, how they like to show the, the, the shot of the a- area immediately surrounding the arena. Yep. And I remember watching game one and they showed the area around outside the arena. It probably was a few dozen fans outside the arena. And that's it. Of, of uh, Washington. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah Obviously, I, Washington's I, on the road. Right. You know, there and um, yeah, there were just a few fans standing outside the arena. Um, mm-hmm. The picture that they posted on this article. I don't know if you saw it. No, I did not. But the fans that are standing outside the arena um, in this case particular picture 10,000 12,000 people minimum I mean it's just a it looks like Times Square on New Year's Eve just shoulder to shoulder people completely filling the streets unbelievable yep so I'm wondering where those fans were during game one (laughs) yeah yeah uh it it has been progressively growing versus the Vegas Golden Knights who have had thousands and thousands of fans all the way through all the way through they have had I I tell you, it it rivaled Toronto and Young Street with the number of fans, a sea of people that they have had in Vegas. It has been unbelievable how many thousands. Yeah. Well, they're showing up now in Washington. Yeah. So, um, well, uh, you know, it makes me wonder when, when when was the last time Washington had a professional sports team win a championship from the Big Four? The Redskins? Yeah, the Redskins. And it was, uh, I think they said 26 years ago, 1992 or something like that. They won the NFL Super Bowl, and of course, Joe Gibbs was on hand at Game 3 to uh, lead the Capitals fans in the chant, and he also was on NBC pregame talking about uh, the last time uh, that uh, the the, uh, 
sport, the, the city of Washington won a sports championship? Yeah, because the Capitals have never won one. The Bullets slash Wizards, I don't believe, have won one, have they? Uh, maybe. I don't, I, I don't believe so. I, I, that I'm not sure on, to be honest with you. Didn't Elvin Hayes play with them? I'm not sure if they won back during his time. Yeah, um, I don't think they did. Um, and, of course, that leaves the Washington Nationals, which are um, – a team that's only been in Washington, what, maybe 20 years? Yeah, not if, that long. If that, because yeah. they moved from Montreal. They were the old Montreal Expos. So, um, And they obviously haven't won anything yet. Not as a Washington um, team, anyway. So, yeah, it's been a while since Washington's won. So I guess we'll just chalk it up to their fans just not knowing how to be a, a winning city. Because <laughs> Boston fans are a little spoiled with all the teams that they have that consistently win. So, and, and the other thing I wanted to note about the fans, the sea of red that's, that we're seeing in the Washington arena is incredible. Yeah. It seems like everybody in the building is wearing red. Yeah, it might be. It, it <laughs> certainly looks that way. Except unless they're a Vegas supporter. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it should be interesting to see the size of the crowd in this it tweeted out in this article or posted out in this article. Um, if Washington ultimately wins the Stanley Cup, I can only imagine what the what the party is going to be like. Yeah, there in Washington, it will, it, it will be wild. Washington, you know, they they will have a big party if they win. It's no question about it. So, and of course, Vegas fans have been all you know are all in as well. But they've been doing it all season long. It's more of a story now that Washington fans have finally showed up. Now that they're a win away. All right, moving on. Um, I saw an article this week that Rocky Wirtz, the owner of the Chicago Blackhawks, is, has been talking this mm-hmm. week. Um, he's said this week that the Blackhawks could look to make changes early next season if the uh, season starts poorly. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not going to have a knee-jerk reaction, Wirtz told uh, Crane's Chicago business. You can't let your emotions be in control. Uh, he added, I think the team will be fine, but if things are off at the beginning of the year, that's a different story. Nothing lasts forever. Right. The report said, uh, asked if that cha- if that means changes could occur right after the holiday season if the team is doing poorly. Wirtz had a short answer, yes. Uh, Wirtz did not say what those changes might be. The Blackhawks this season failed to make the playoffs for the first time since 2008 after winning the Stanley Cup in 2010, 13, and 15. Yep, I did not see this article. I did not hear about this, and this is very interesting to me. But it doesn't make – I mean, they are they are resting on their laurels this season. Yeah. Um, because they've had three three cup – every time they've made a run, practically, they've won the Stanley Cup. So Well, and the changes they made last summer was basically – it almost felt like that they were trying to bring back the same guys that they had the last time they won the Stanley Cup. Right. And they had to get rid of them then due to salary cap reasons. But now they were trying to uh, bring them all back for next year, you know, last season, trying to, uh, uh, as it were, bring the band back together. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So and that rarely works. Every time I've seen a a team try to hold on to the same same group of guys, it usually it usually turns out to be, you know, it's it's hard. It's hard to to remanufacture that, you know, that catching lightning in a bottle like like that. I guess is, is probably the be- the point I'm trying to make. Right. And the and the Blackhawks tried to do it last year, and you know it, they failed miserably. Um, yeah. And it looks like not many changes are going to be made. I mean, the what I'm gra- gathering from these remarks, it looks like the Blackhawks are not going to be making many changes this summer to their team. Kind of going with the same guys that they had, uh, mm-hmm. hoping that everybody has bounce back years. Which, uh, understandable, the Blackhawks are right tight against the cap, so they certainly can't go out and sign a free agent anyway. Um, so it looks like they're just going to take a wait-and-see approach, and if they kind of fall on their face again at the beginning of the year, you're going to see um, you're going to see uh, moves be made. And it could be, Wayne. I, I don't know. This offseason, you might see a move. I, I don't know. You might see somebody go, one of the big players on that team, uh, decide he's going to leave and go somewhere else. Yep. Uh, don't know. Wouldn't so, surprise me. It'll be certainly something to uh, worth watching anyway as the as we progress into the summer. All right. Next story I have. Uh, did you see that P.K. Subban and Bruin Zdeno Chara were in school together? I did see this article. <laughs> yes, I did see this one. Yep. P.K. Subban and Zdeno Chara aren't teammates, but they were Ivy League classmates this week. The two all-star defensemen attended Harvard Business School together, taking courses in the business of entertainment, media, and sports. The three-day program teaches proven approaches for launching and managing creative products and portfolios, managing and marketing talent, 
assessing and determining when to make smaller versus blockbuster bets, identifying and capitalizing on market disruptions and other strategic challenges, according to the school's website. It's designed for professionals in the talent industry, including athletes, musicians, actors, and agents. Uh, Chara and Subban shared some of their experiences on social media. And, of course, there's, there's, um, there's a link to in this article to um, P.K. Subban's uh, account where he's basically uh, live tweeting from the classroom, him and Chara. Yeah. And he, and he posted a, a short little video on Twitter, and then he said uh, in his tweet, my classmate, Big Z. And it shows the two of them. The, yes. <laughs> this shows the two of them just kind of standing together. So P- PK has a flair about him for really he. I mean, he doesn't lay an egg. Have you ever noticed that? No. Nope. He uh, he's yeah. very good at at whatever situation he's in or whatever he's promoting. He's very good at touting it. He's oh, extremely yeah. good at 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 uh, his you know his skill in uh, in making it. Um, uh, the cat's meow yep. is really good. You know, uh, he's good at it. Well, let's put it this way. When his playing days are over, he's not going to disappear. No, no, he won't. He's going to find, <laughs> he's going to find another way. Um, I would hope he's going to end up in the broadcast booth because I think he'll be very entertaining to watch. Yeah. Um, hopefully he won't go into coaching and, and be one of those guys. Cause those guys, you know, give their boring, what a, you know, boring cliche answers all the time in, in press interviews. Uh, PK is way too colorful for, for the standard, <laughs> The standard rehearsed answer to every question. But yeah, the article goes on. Um, Subban called Chara, quote, an uh, an old acquaintance of mine in a video he shared from the class on Thursday. (laughs) Chara posted some thoughts on his Instagram account. Uh, He said, quote, it's been an absolutely unbelievable experience and I love every piece of it. Every minute, every class. Such a great time to spend after the season, he said in the video. Uh, The Nashville Predators and Boston Bruins defensemen weren't the only professional athletes in the class. Michael Strahan, former Super Bowl champion with the New York Giants, and current TV personality, former NBA player Chris Bosh, Olympic ski champion Lindsey Vaughn, former NFL wide receiver Mohamed Mas- Masakwai, and a international soccer players Kaka. Is that guy really named Kaka? <laughs> All right, I don't, I don't do soccer, obviously. Uh, Mario Melcho, Melcho. I don't know any soccer player names. Edwin Vandersar and Nuri Sahin were also in the group. The professor, Anita Elbers, shared a picture with her famous students on Instagram. So, yeah, they're all pretty much athletes. So so interesting to see PK and Chara getting together off because on the ice, when um, you know the Bruins played the Canadiens before PK got traded, those two battled like two guys that hated each other. Yep. And here they are hanging out together. <clears throat> yep. So, and of course, PK making appearances in Boston, Boston Bruins fans automatically jump to the conclusion that that the Preds are going to trade PK to to the Bruins and PK is going to play for the Bruins from now on. (laughs) And of course, I'm sure nothing is going back to to Nashville for the exchange. Yeah. Just because PK was in Boston doesn't mean he's (laughs) he's going to be a Boston Bruin. Bruins fans. Some of the Bruins fans are crazy when it comes to uh, rumors like that. But anyway, I thought that was an interesting story. That was that was that was a very interesting story. And of course, the scouting combine was this week. Yep. uh, Where all the top prospects in the uh, in the upcoming NHL draft were in Buffalo at the Harbor Center uh, to take part in the uh, scouting combine, basically where they measure basically put numbers to everything everything i mean jumping and speed and reach and you name it you know i think they stole this from the nfl yeah just just nobody is going to um it's not going to make or break their draft based on their results in the scouting combine it just gives the teams a little bit more information about each player um and the players go through interviews so they get tested on a mental and physical abilities um basically the players get treated by like like they're basically treated like cattle, really, right. as as they're being showcased before they go through the draft. <laughs> I mean, it's, right. they're just treated as pieces of meat, essentially. Um, really, nothing that nothing of note that I saw come out of it. I mean, I watched a two hour. Uh, I think it was on Sportsnet in Canada. They they posted it on YouTube, and I watched it a couple days ago. Um, they spent most of the three hour special on the scouting combine 
focus on Rasmus Dahlin and and you know he, they interviewed him and then they, they he seemed to be the major picture. Every, yeah, every picture you saw of the scouting combine, yeah. Rasmus Dahlin was or Dahlin yeah. was, was in it. Well, he's going to be the he's going to be the number one overall pick. He's going to Buffalo. It's pretty much uh, you know he's they're calling him a generational defenseman. So unless somebody blows away the the Buffalo Sabers with a trade offer, uh, it looks like Dahlin or Dahlin is going to Buffalo with that first overall pick. But they also spent some time with some of the other top prospects. Uh, around the league. I know that I I was particularly interested in the Svechnikov situation because he's projected to go second overall to the Carolina Hurricanes in the draft. And all the announcers and all the people in the press were basically saying that if you were to take Darlene out of this draft, Svechnikov is the undisputed number one. So, um, so it seems to be one and two are pretty clear cut, and then it just gets foggy from there. Right. Um, and everybody was in agreement that the, the Canes would be stupid to go with anybody but Svechnikov. So right. I guess we'll see. And they're saying that he will be. And I saw him too. Vetchenko, of course, they have him in shorts and tank tops. He seemed to be way more physically developed than than most of the other prospects there, including Dalin. So, and they were saying that that Svechnikov is NHL ready, as is Dalin, to step in and play right away, year one. Right. So, just more information for the uh, scouts as we head into the draft. That's pretty much all the <laughs> the whole point of the scouting combine. So. <laughs> Nothing really earth shattering came out of that. All right. Speaking of the Carolina Hurricanes, I don't know if you saw this article this week, but and, the, and um, this is one I did not see. <clears throat> uh, Don Waddell, GM of the Carolina Hurricanes, uh, has come out to say that the Hurricanes are likely to make some changes. Uh, the Her- Carolina Hurricanes could be looking to shake up their roster after missing the Stanley Cup final playoffs for a ninth straight season uh what i'll told uh nhl.com on thursday um you know no need to rehash where the hurricanes have finished basically they continue to seems like every year finish just outside the um the playoffs which kind of kills them in the draft because they never seem to pick uh you know in the very high spots in the draft they're they're picking down in the lower part of that first um, group but uh this season they won the lottery um, or war- they were one of the three winners of of the draft lottery so they will be picking number two overall. Mm-hmm. So they will get a very good player. Um, and some questions were asked of Waddell during this uh, during this interview. Uh, first and foremost, how drastically does the roster have to change for the Hurricanes to be successful? Waddell answered, I think we need to make some changes. We have some players that have been there a long time. We've got nine years missing the playoffs. I think if there's some change that needs to be made, change up the mix a little bit, the culture, we're certainly going to look at that. We're not in any disparate situation. It's not a fire sale. If every player comes back, that's perfect with us. But I think there's also some opportunities and some players that maybe a fresh change and a fresh team might be good for them and bring us some assets that we could use. Uh, Next question, how close are the Hurricanes to being a playoff team? (laughs) It seems to sense the... uh, reoccurring theme here i think if you go back to last year i hate to blame it on one position but we think our goaltending if it would have been average in the league we definitely would have been in the postseason i would agree with that uh you can reflect upon the goalies i felt like every time we got on a little bit of a roll we didn't get the big game that we needed so i think that's an area that we really have to address we have lots of balls in the air right now to address that position so sounds like phone calls are being made yeah uh, and then naturally the follow-up question to that is, can St- Scott Darling be that guy for you? Uh, he answered, I think Scott's got to prove it to us. He had a very up and down year last year. I don't think he was fully prepared to be a number one guy last year. He knows physically he's got to be much better shape. He probably played f- played 15 pounds heavier than he did the year before in Chicago. Uh, I know he's already starting on a program this summer. He's back in Raleigh here th- in the next week. He's committed to an off-season workout with our strength and conditioning coach. But he's got to prove it to us now. Nothing is going to be given to him. Hopefully, we'll have other guys compelling with him for or competing with him for a job. Competition usually is good for everybody. So uh, they're they're admitting that's a very good answer. Don Don gave. Yep, they're admitting that Darling came in out of shape or came into camp out of shape last fall. So that's uh, and you know once once you do that in this day and age, used to be years ago. If you, you know players, they all came in out of shape. And they yep. used training camp to get themselves into game shape. Yep. And they got away with it. And they got away with it because there was nobody really there to take their job, per se. Nowadays, there's thousands of players trying to make it to the to the best league in the world. Yep. And if you don't stay on top of your fitness, there's somebody right behind you waiting to take your job. Yep. Uh, oh. 
God, Wayne, you couldn't have said so, it any better. That's very good. Yeah. So they brought up Cam Ward. Speaking of goalies, uh, we're still talking about Cam Ward, um, or we're still, ta- yeah, talking about Cam. Depending on what we do here, if you look at what Cam's done for the organization, he's had a great career. His numbers were pretty good last year. He was put in some tough situations and, for the most part, responded to that role. Great locker room guy, great guy to have around the team, especially with a young team. We haven't made the decision yes or no yet, but if everything worked out, it would be nice to have him around. You know what I would almost see if they ultimately find a way to get two decent goalies in here, I could see them talking Cam into retiring and becoming a goalie coach. Yeah, well, throw that yeah. out there because he's up there in age, and, and Cam's happy in this area. He's That's well documented. He doesn't want to leave this area. He doesn't want to leave the Canes organization. He wants to stay put. His family's got roots here now. Um, I believe he's got kids, so you know there's the school situation. He doesn't want to leave. He likes it here. Right. So if he can't make it as a player, he might he might be uh, a good coach to have around. So I I wouldn't be surprised to see something like that happen. That if they ha- they they don't have room for him on the roster, that he could find a way to stay here by uh, by retiring and and uh, joining the coaching staff. Have you been getting calls from teams interested in the number two pick in the draft? Uh, what else said I've gotten a lot of calls, and what I've told teams is we're keeping the pick. If you want to present something to me, it's my role as general manager to listen to what you have to say. If someone wants to put a package together that we can't say no to, assets for the organization and where and where we're headed, we would look at it, but it's going to be very difficult for somebody to get that pick from us. <coughs> so they're go- they're going to have to be blown away by a deal. I yeah, I don't don't see that happening, Wayne. Yep. Not this draft. No. Nope. Yeah. I don't uh, next question, do you have a player or position in mind as a target for the number two pick? So basically, whoever was interviewing him wanted to find out if they were, you know, trying to get a gauge on who they're going to pick. <laughs> he said, I don't think I'd be giving away anything to say we're looking at the forwards for sure. There's some great defensemen there, but with the four guys we have for sure right now, and we've got some young defensemen coming, I think the forwards that are in this draft are game breakers and game changers. I think it's no doubt in my mind that it'll be a forward that we'll pick. Well, how about this? What if Buffalo passes on Rasmus Dahlin? Yeah, that's been thrown out there. What if that, and you know, that might happen. They may say, look, we we really don't need the generational defenseman right now. We need this. And so they they pick Shvechnikov yep. or whoever. Yep. What what's what's Carolina going to do in that position? They, do you think they, they let Darlene go? No, you can't. You can't let a player like that go. I think they keep him. Yep. If if Buffalo passes on Darlene, um, and there's no there's no evidence out there to saying that that's happened, but you know there is always that chance. Oh, if they absolutely. pass on him, I think at that high in the draft, you got to take the best player available. Well, I agree. And and it 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 you know the thing is Wayne. That the, that first pick is the mindset of the people in the room in Buffalo. That's really what it is. Yep. And whether or not they pick Rasmus Dahlin, that's what it. That's the people that it matters. That that's that's who's in the know. So they may not pick him. And it you know, I mean, chance. I mean, I would think it would be a foolish move. But um, stranger things have happened, and you've seen this go on in drafts before. You know, you know that. Uh, it's not always what what it seems at the uh, at the NHL draft or for that matter any other professional sports draft. Yeah, absolutely, definitely, good point. Um, and then of course the article continues. They they talk about some of the players that are available at the top of the draft. They brought up Philip Zadina, um, who's projected to go third overall, or anywhere from third to fifth, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, Philip Zadina, they they brought it up because. Uh, Zadina and Martin Nietzsche, who is already a uh, Carolina Hurricanes uh, prospect, Mm -hmm. uh, played together and had a lot of chemistry um, together as line mates. And um, they asked about him in particular. And, of course, Waddell said, uh, we've talked about it. It is a factor. How much of a factor in time we'll know. Uh, You get to know the players because now we can ask our player. And, obviously, he's he's only got good things to say about him. (laughs) At the end of the day, players will adapt to who they're playing with, and we're going to continue to just make sure that we get the right player. <laughs> so that tells me, yeah, Sedina is probably not going to be the guy that they're going to pick. I think they're absolutely going with Svechnikov in this case. Yeah. So, anyway, kind of an interesting story about the uh, our local team. That Very good, Wayne. That was an excellent, excellent story. All right, and just a couple of honors, mile or honors this week that have come out, and these are kind of off the ice, more of press. Uh, the Philadelphia Flyers and the Dallas Stars are the 2018 recipients of the Dick Dillman Award presented annually by the Professional Hockey Writers Association to honor the work of outstanding NHL public relations staffs in each conference. The Flyers and the Stars PR departments each won the Dillman Award in 2015 
And this marks a third time in six years that Philly has been recognized, led by Senior Director of Communications, Zach Hill, and assisted by Director of Public Relations, uh, Joe Seville, and Manager of Broadcasting Media Services, Brian Smith. So and, and there's a link to the article in here. I'm not going to go too much into this. And other than the fact that the only thing that came to my mind is if we're agreeing that this is a award going to public relations departments for NHL teams, why wasn't Vegas considered? I mean, look what they did. Their Twitter account, hilarious. Yeah. You know, everything that they're doing with public. Well, I think this award should not be called a public relations award. It's almost a press relations because yeah. the, te- the teams that won it were it was awarded by the Professional Hockey Writers Association. I think it's 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 not public relations. It's press relations. Right. Because if it were public relations, meaning the fans involved. Right. The stuff that Vegas did this year was fantastic. It right. really was. I agree. Everything from their Twitter account to their to all the promotions they did, just they did stuff that you haven't seen before around the NHL. Right. So if they I were agree. truly giving it as a public relations award, Vegas should have absolutely been considered for it. But anyway, I digress. All right. I agree. <laughs> and the other award that came out this week, Joe Bowen will receive the Foster Hewitt Memorial Award for Outstanding Contributions as a Hockey Broadcaster. And Larry Brooks will receive the Elmer Ferguson Award for Excellence in Hockey Journalism during the 2018 Hall of Fa- Hockey Hall of Fame induction weekend. And that's coming up. Uh, uh, I don't have it in front of me. Whenever that who is. Was, who does he work with? Uh, I don't have that in front of me either. Uh, Larry Brooks, Course New York Post, does the Rangers beat. Um uh, Maple Leafs, uh, Bowen is with Maple Leafs. Okay. Um, I, I know uh, I, uh, Larry Brooks has had some very colorful run-ins with John Tortorella, as you'll recall. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I, I I don't know. He's, I mean, he's deserving of it. He has done, he has done the, ra- he's been the Rangers, uh, he's done the, ra- he's had the Rangers beat for a long time. Yeah, he was with the Post since 1995, according to this article. And he's and he's covered the Rangers for the past 22 seasons. Yep. So, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, you, you want me to be perfectly honest? I, I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad he's winning an award because he has put in a large body of work with the New York Rangers. Yep. Um, he's very critical of them, uh, extremely critical of them. Um, but uh, I that disagreed seems, with what that he seems, thought. Yeah, and that's and that's, he was not he was not an uh, Alain Vigneault. Uh, yeah, I really thought he would be too because he you know he and Tortorella had some massive run-ins together. But yeah. uh, he 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 kind of he painted uh, Vigneault as as a softy who uh, who kind of let the players rule a team, which I disagreed with. Yeah, well, you know it. And that and that's typical New York press anyway. All the sports teams in New York are they're they're held to a high standard by the press. And if they think you're screwing up, they're gonna let you know about it. Oh, so it's the same way in Boston. Yeah, and and it definitely is the same way in some of the cities in Canada, Toronto, uh, Montreal. Vancouver. Yeah. It's getting to be a pressure cooker out there. Yep. So yeah, there's cer- certain teams, certain cities where where it fe- if you if you are a member of the organization, whether it be a player or front office staff, and you're reading the papers in that city, you you, you might give you a complex th- that you're thinking you can't do anything right. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, but there's a couple of guys that have been around the game for a long time and are going to, uh, be... and kudos, kudos to Larry Brooks. Yep. Let me just say it that way. Kudos to Larry Brooks, because as I said, uh, he's put, he's put the, he's put the very powerful spotlight that he has <clears throat> a very powerful spotlight on the machinations of the New York Rangers at times. Yep, and Joe Bowen, being a, a broadcaster for the Toronto Maple Leafs, arguably the uh, New York Yankees of the NHL, um, he's he holds a very powerful spotlight as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, all right, moving on. Uh, power ranking. Yeah, and you know, Wayne, surprisingly, it's my week this week. Uh, closing out, it's my week, and we're going to spend one minute on it. All right. <laughs> The time that it says for me to announce is a natural number one is Washington. They're leading 3-1 in the Stanley Cup. Yep. Who wouldn't put them number one? Right. Number two is the Vegas Golden Knights, the other team in the Stanley Cup Finals. Everybody else is sitting at home watching, now so this, you have to put them number two. Now, this is flipped from last week because we were in agreement that Vegas was one, Washington was two. Granted, when we recorded last week, it, the the series was one nothing Vegas, and Vegas looked practically unbeatable in that first game. So what what they lose three three games coming to the Cup final four. Yeah, they've I mean, lost three in a row now. So it 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 was an I mean you, 
you'd be stupid not to put them number one. Yeah, Vegas won game one, and Washington has won the last three. So, And then, of course, I have an honorable mention, and that's the Tampa Bay Lightning. They certainly did play the better of the two teams, Tampa Bay and Winnipeg, in the conference finals. So I put them as my number three honorable mention, and that pretty much puts that whole thing to bed, Wayne. Yep. We're done with the power rankings. Pretty much, yep, until uh, probably after free agency at this point. No point in talking about it at this point. Uh, maybe do one around the draft, but see the the draft is only going to include at most a handful of players that are going to make their NHL rosters. So even the draft isn't going to swing it very far. All right, so we're moving on to our minor league minute, and um, I'll just real quickly go over basically giving an update on uh, everything that's happened in the Calder Cup playoffs, and then you've got an American Hockey League story that you want to uh, bring out. So. Um, so where we are at in the Calder Cup uh, playoffs is we were, as of the last recording, we were heading into the Calder Cup final, Toronto versus Texas, and they had right. yet to play a game in the in the in the um, Calder Cup final. Well, since then they have played three games, and game one went to the Toronto Marlies, and that was at Toronto. That was a six-five final. Game two went to Texas. That was a two-one final, and that game was also in Toronto. And game three switches over to now they use the two-three-two format. So three, four, and five are all going to be in Texas. So with Texas earning the split, that gives them a huge advantage going back home for the next three games with a one-one series tie. Um, but Toronto managed to steal that first game in Texas, two to one, and uh, now the series sits at two-one Toronto Marlies, and there are as many as four games left in the series: two in Texas and then two in Toronto. So Texas is still somewhat in the driver's seat. If they just win their two home games, that gives them a 3-2 series lead going back to Toronto for the final two games of the series. Uh, but Texas has officially given up the home ice advantage that they earned by uh, splitting the first two games. And Toronto now technically holds home ice once again. So Toronto, all they have to do is win their two home games, games six and seven, and they and they take the call to cup. But um, from all accounts, I haven't actually been able to see the games because, you know, of our well chronicled disdain for uh, American Hockey League's ridiculously p- priced online streaming package. <laughs> I'm going to keep bringing it up. And, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, so I haven't been able to watch the games, but from all accounts that I've seen online, this series has been uh, very entertaining so far. Uh, you know, all three games were one goal games. So um, certainly, uh, certainly looks like it's been an entertaining series. Yes. You'd have to say it has been. I haven't seen anything. I have read some articles, uh, of course, while we study for our podcast each week. Yeah. But it does, like you say, look like it's being – it's a, ven- a very entertaining final. Yep. All right. And you have a story out of the American League as well. Yes, I do, Wayne. And, and I just wanted to uh, briefly preface this article uh, by saying that uh, the, uh, the run to the – uh, Stanley Cup for this season has been quite something, really, for the city of Washington. Vegas, of course, is a newcomer. Uh, what they've done is tremendous, but they did it with the man who put it together in Washington, and that's George McPhee. If you talk about the uh, the Stanley Cup this year, you're going to talk about a team in the Washington Capitals who, un- there's no question about it, they have, over the years, the best AHL team in existence, the Hershey Bears. Uh, Hershey has won the Calder Cup more than anyone. Yep. And they are season in, season out, scrutinized as the perennial best team in the AHL. It always seems that way. There there oh. always seems to be in the mix, yeah. Yep. And their, their affiliation has changed over the years. Hershey Bears yes. weren't always the Capitals. That's correct. They've been, that is true. They've been several, yeah, they've been under several teams, but yeah, anyway. That, that, that is correct, and, but, but with that, Washington has a, uh, they have a, a you know, tremendous, um, you know, uh, asset to their organization, uh, without a doubt. They have an asset that other, other organizations don't have, um, and that is the history that has been put together there in Hershey, Pennsylvania. My article is in regards to their coach who was fired this season because expectations were not met there. there. And that gentleman's name is Troy Mann. The article that I'm talking about came on AHL.com. The cup final is bittersweet validation for fired Hershey coach. Article goes like this. 
The text message lit up Troy Mann's phone the morning after the Capitals eliminated the Penguins with a patchwork lineup featuring five rookies. It came from Barry Trotz. Thanks, Manor, for having all those rookie caps ready, Trotz wrote. They all played well. You own a piece of this win last night. And believe me, that is a big, big win in the coaching career of Barry Trotz. That is the biggest thing he has ever pulled off because he did what no other person could do, knock the Penguins out. Yep. He did. So if they lose this cup final, they're still going to have to say that. I don't think they will. Man beamed, man beamed with pride when more than half a dozen players – he coached with the American Hockey League's Hershey Bears, contributed to the victory that got the Capitals into the Eastern Conference Final. Many of those players are still playing key roles for Washington in the Stanley Cup Final against the Vegas Golden Knights, more than a month after Mann was fired from his job as Hershey's head coach. This is a bittersweet time for Mann, who had a hand in the development of Jacob Vrana, Chandler Stevenson, and Kristen Juice as coach and was in a and was an assistant when Braden Holtby, John Carlson, Dmitry, Dmitry Orlov, Andre Burakovsky, Jay Beagle, and Tom Wilson went through Hershey on their way to the NHL. Heard any of those guys' names before recently? Oh, yeah. Considering their success of those players and Hershey products Nate Schmidt and Cody Eakin contributing for Vegas, the cup final is a validation of man's methods of getting prospects ready for the next level. I called Troy Mann the other day and thanked him for producing a lot of good players, Trotz said. All the players he had the last couple of years are playing in the Stanley Cup Finals. Guys who haven't played a playoff game before. They've brought some of that winning tradition they had in Hershey. It's important for those guys to be a part of it. Mann has remained connected to the Capitals' playoff run by talking to Trotz and Hershey video coach Mike King, who's in Washington. Amid interviews with other organizations for another AHL job or work as an NHL assistant, he has, wa he has watched about 80% of the Capitals' games this postseason and can see the elements in players' games he and assistant Ryan Murphy harped on improving during their four-year tenure. After giving Verana some tough love by scratching him in the playoffs a year ago, Mann notices the 22-year-old winger getting between the face-off dots to create offense like he asked. He watches Stevenson playing with the consistency that was sometimes lacking in Hershey, which was all part of the plan. As much as Mann notices the improvement from afar, the players feel it too and credit him for giving them the playing time to grow their games in Hershey, a market that expects championships as much as development. But after three playoff appearances, including a trip to the Calder Cup final in 2016, Missing the postseason this year led to the Capitals not renewing Mann's contract. Troy is a dedicated and hardworking coach, and we appreciate all he has done for the Hershey Bears, Capitals GM Brian McClellan said in a statement. At this point, we feel a fresh approach and a change in leadership is needed in order for us to continue to develop our young players towards the next level and for success at the, NA at the AHL level. Hmm. That stung man who worked eight of the past nine years in the Capitals system made Hershey his home in that time, and believed he did his job. I think it's very difficult for anybody to tell me that I haven't done my job here, Mann said. I'm very grateful they gave me my first opportunity. As much as I'd love to be the head coach of Hershey next year, the only thing I can hope for now is that other NHL teams are recognizing the work that we did here, and that'll help pay off in the next few weeks here of securing another opportunity. Man was a finalist for one job already and is in demand as Ottawa, Arizona, and Colorado all look to fill AHL head coaching vacancies. He has a big supporter in Trotz who said recently the Capitals wouldn't be in the Eastern Conference champion, would not be the Eastern Conference champions without Mann and Murphy helping develop Stevenson, Vrana, Juice, Nathan Walker, Travis Boyd, and Madison Bowley. Bowley. They did a really good job, Trotz said. They've developed well, and they've been a big part of it. So that's really kind of, I, I thought it was very, very interesting. Um, you know, a team in the Hershey Bears who uh, they're expected to be a perennial playoff team. And yep. uh, they got rid of a good coach who's done very well for them. So the standard is very high in so, the Washington Capitals organization. So if they get rid of him, does that mean the Capitals probably won't bring him up to the NHL in, in a possible assistant role? Or <clears throat> It sounds like Trotz likes him. Hmm. Um, but why get rid of a, an existing 
assistant uh, in Washington now if they win the cup, you know? Yeah. Um, so he's got to try and, uh, I guess... Uh, sounds like uh, sounds like he'll turn up somewhere at some point, though. Yeah. If he's if he's that well regarded with Washington, he's probably that well or at, as well regarded by other coaching ranks, and uh, I'm sure he'll turn up somewhere else. Um, but yeah, with with him developing several players on both teams, and of course George McPhee having his fingerprints all over both teams in this series, it's just kind of yeah. a weird situation to see this because you know, as you know, uh, McPhee drafted Ovechkin, he drafted, yeah. uh, I think he even drafted uh, Kuznetsov and uh, Backstrom. He may have just uh, drafted Backstrom, right? But uh, yeah, McPhee's fingerprints are all over the Capitals, and they're, of course yeah. they're all over the, the Vegas Golden Knights. So must be must feel weird. And him and um and um uh name escapes me, the GM the current GM of the Capitals. Uh, uh yeah, his his name is uh They're good friends off the ice. Oh, oh they are. They're um, they're former college roommates. Yeah, they, they went to bowling green together. Yep. And that's where uh McPhee played hockey. Yep. Um, yeah, they were teammates on the hockey team at bowling green. Brian McClellan. Brian McClellan yep. is his name. Yep. So yeah, it's just a lot of intertwining <laughs> relations. Yeah. Of course, that's that's the way it is. At this these this day and age in, in modern hockey, is guys know each other, they end up on different teams, and um, but this, this is without a doubt, this is the George McPhee Stanley Cup final. It it really is. Yep. Uh, Washington has earned it. So yep, for sure. Good story. Thank you. All right, we're moving on to our picks of the week. We're winding things down here. And uh, I've got an interesting story out of the referee ranks, and you've got one. Let's see, I have it right in front of me. Yeah, mine is one that'll promote a discussion, uh, and it's in regards to Pat Sajak. All right, why don't I get mine out of the way? Okay. Uh, because it's kind of an interesting story out of the referee ranks. Garrett Rank. I don't know if you recognize that name, but he is an NHL referee. Um, he's fairly new to the referee ranks. Um, he's ref. Uh, he refed 76 NHL regular season games this season, um, but he made news this week because he has qualified for and will play in the U.S. Open Golf Championship uh, later this month. Yeah, that is amazing. And um, if you know anything about golf, you know that just making the field of the U.S. Open, the U.S. Open, the reason it's called the U.S. Open, it is an open golf tournament. Anybody in America, or anybody in the world for that matter, can qualify for this golf championship if you're a good enough player. Anybody. Yeah. You, me, anybody. We can go to one of the, one of the, they have, you know, they have sectional qualifiers, uh, qualifiers, they have regional qualifiers. And if you work your way through the different tournaments, and if you're good enough, anybody can make the U.S. Open golf championship not just professional golfers. If obviously the field is full of professional golfers, but there are amateurs that also uh, make the field as well. Well, Garrett Rank has officially made it and he will play in the US Open. This uh this later this uh I know the tournament is in June. I just can't remember which weekend. Uh and he says, a uh, hockey and golf for high pressure sporting events." Rank told the Mar the Marietta Daily Journal. It would be really cool in 2018 to say that I played with the best players in the world in a major championship and officiate the best hockey league in the world. Uh the 30-year-old, a full-time NHL referee since 2016, made the US Open on Monday when he tied for first at a sectional qualifying event in Roswell, Georgia. His caddy was NHL referee Dan O'Rourke, ESPN said. The 118th U.S. Open Championship will be held at Shinnecock Hills in Southampton, New York from June 14th through the 17th. Realistically, I think I'm capable of making the cut and would love to make the cut, Rank told the record of Kitch uh, Kitchener, Ontario. If I could play four rounds at the U.S. Open, I would be extremely thrilled. Rank, a native of Elmira, Ontario, is the 78th rank amateur golfer in the world. He made his NHL debut back on January 15th, 2015, and has officiated 187 NHL games getting his first Stanley Cup playoff experience this postseason as an injury replacement for linesman Steve Barton in Game 2 of the Eastern Conference first round between the Capitals and the Blue Jackets. Rank, who, has, who had testicular cancer in 2011, finished second at the 2012 U.S. Amateur Championship and played for Canada at the 2015 Pan Am Games. He's been an official in the American Hockey League and the ECHL and is on his way up to the NHL. I think about it a little bit, but when you look at 2018 and figure you've officiated a couple of periods in the Stanley Cup playoffs 
and then you get to have a couple of rounds in the U.S. Open playing in a major championship against the best players in the world. You can't really argue with that, Rank told the record. I'm quite happy with having a job and being able to play golf at this level uh, on the side. So very interesting story. That is truly amazing to see him be able to pull it because, you know, obviously he's we know what he's doing with his spare time when he's not refereeing hockey games. So, yeah, <laughs> he's playing yeah. a lot of golf. That's incredibly difficult. To you've do. got to you've got to be um, an extremely talented golfer. And even you just have one bad round. A couple of bad holes at those sectional qualifiers, and you play yourself right out of that. Yeah. So you have to have everything line up perfectly to be able to make it through all those qualifying events because they only take a, only a couple of players from each of those qualifiers right. to uh, to join the field. So, so I guess we'll be That's pulling for him. It'll be the experience of a lifetime, I'm sure it will be. Yep. And Shinnecock Hills has a lot of history to it. That course has been around for a long, long time. Yep. Yeah, they do go back to, of course, the U.S. Open. They do a different course every year, but they do tend to go around to the same, you know, 20, 30, 50, what, however many it is, uh, golf courses. Um, Shinnecock Hills, I'm sure, has hosted U.S. Opens before. I know they've hosted many, many, many pro events yeah. over the no, years. It's, it, yeah, it has, it has hosted the U.S. Open met several times before. I, yeah. I don't know. How yeah, many it's, it's, it's a very well-known golf course, but... The, the When you get to that tournament, though, that U.S. Open tournament, I, I've watched it, and when they set up that golf course to get it ready for those golfers, man, do they set it up hard. Yeah. They set it up so that the greens are as fast as if you were, you were putting across concrete, and you know the rough just off the fairway, the tall grass, they, they let it grow extra long for this tournament. Yeah. They, they make it, so it is a very tough test for, for all the golfers. So much so that all you know the golfers over the years complain about the U.S. Open. The conditions are are almost unfair because if you're if if you're not driving the ball straight down the fairway, um, <laughs> and you get it into that long grass, you can pretty much kiss your round goodbye. Because <laughs> yeah, it's a penalty for missing shots in the U.S. Open is severe to say the least. So, uh, but this isn't a golf show. This is a hockey show. So let's uh, move on. Um, that was good so congratulations to him for making the field anyway. And of course, I'll probably uh, keep one eye on that tournament to see how he does. And we can provide follow ups in later later episodes. All right. You have an interesting my story my, well. uh, my uh, article to close it all out, Wayne, is in regards to Pat Sajak. And I I'll start this off by saying several more than one year, more than once. I have watched the outdoor classic and seen them interview. Pat Sajak, who makes his way to every single one of them. He has not missed one. He'll let you know that, too, in an interview. He's been to all of them. Uh, don't know whether he went to this year's, but um, I, I know he up through uh, the last. I, I, I don't know if they interviewed him uh, for the Rangers Outdoor Classic this year, but I believe all the way up to that classic, he had been to every game. He truly is uh, a, a very big fan of the game, and I knew that. But I never knew what team he pulled for. I really didn't. Um, and this this past week on Sunday, of course, he made his debut as a guy announcing uh, the starting lineups for the game. And he has not done that before, to my knowledge. But he did it this week, and it pr- it prompted an outroar uh, from, from people uh, who were following this. Um, and there was an article on NHL.com that I'll read first, and then I'll read the reaction that he got from several people. The article on NHL.com says Sajak announces starting lineups before game three of the Stanley Cup final. The game show host, Capitals season ticket holder, takes center stage. Pat Sajak took the stage Saturday and no one even needed to spin or buy a vowel. (laughs) The Washington Capitals season ticket holder and longtime host of the game show Wheel of Fortune announced the starting lineups before Game 3 of the Stanley Cup Final between Washington and the Vegas Golden Knights. Sajak has been a capital season ticket holder since 2005 and 6 and took the ice clad in a red pullover. He gave a brief history of his Capitals fandom before reading off the starters for the first Cup Final game at Capital One Arena since 1998. We have seen great teams, great players, great moments. And we have seen triumph, and we have also seen disappointment, Sajak said, addressing the sold-out crowd. But this season, this team, this playoff run surpassed it all. 
Sajak also has season tickets for the Los Angeles Kings, since he has recorded episodes of Wheel of Fortune for more than 25 years in Los Angeles. He has seen the evolution of hockey in the U.S. capital, particularly since Washington has had forward Alex Ovechkin on its side. It really began with Ovechkin, Sajak said on NHL Network before Game 3. The Caps had a pretty good fan base, but when he came, When that team was built, now you can't find a seat. It was not the case when we started coming. There were a lot of empty seats. Sajak has also been compelled by the cup final thus far. This playoff series thus far has been just breathtaking, Sajak said. We have enjoyed every minute of it. These are two great teams. Now, you know, I I was kind of happy to see him out there in the ice and kind of finally learn of his his allegiance to the team. But boy, did that ever (laughs) – did that ever – create a stir in the social media world, particularly in Twitter. And I wanted to also bring up CBSnews.com's story because they chronicled Sajak's appearance. So that article went like this. Throughout the Golden Knights' improbable playoff run, Vegas has left countless people stunned with wacky, over-the-top pregame ceremonies at T-Mobile Arena. I've been, you know, actually looking forward to tonight's With the Stanley Cup final shifting back to D.C. for Game 3 on Saturday night, many wondered how the Capitals would counter in the way of pregame festivities at Capital One Arena, matching or exceeding the excitement and absurdity of the Vegas uh, spectacle would be a tough undertaking as the Golden Knights employed a catapult, Michael Buffer, and Imagine Dragons in the first couple of games in the series. But perhaps a city that has waited 20 years to host the Stanley Cup final game would bring their A-game to counter Vegas, or perhaps not. The Caps' response to the night's opening showcase was to have Wheel of Fortune host and longtime season ticket holder Pat Sajak stand at center ice and tell everyone about his tickets before reading the lineups from a sheet of paper while wearing his best Washington pullover. It wasn't exactly pulse-pounding stuff. If you're underwhelmed, just know you are not alone. Folks on Twitter were... Quite disappointed by the lack of fireworks, sword fights, and catapults this time <laughs> around. Here's one, the first one from Greg Wisniewski. 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 Dear God, please stop. And that actually was a picture of uh, an answer on Wheel of Fortune. The, the letters were all turned oh, okay. around to say, Dear God, please stop. <laughs> he, he happened to find that somewhere online and then tweeted that out to people. Wow. A second tweet from Adam Gretz. This is amazing. Vegas has an over-the-top show for its intro, and D.C. has some old white guy filibustering on the ice. Who says the NHL doesn't know what it's doing? (laughs) And then in a third one from Colin Dunlap, he kind of hit the nail on the head. No one gives a hell about Pat Sajak's season tickets. But nobody, nobody in the world was more upset by Sajak's pregame performance than one Keith Olbermann, who attempted to go scorched earth on Sajak via Twitter. Oh, God. With that level of anger, we can only presume Sajak has peed in Olbermann's breakfast cereal or kicked his dog at one point. This tweet, if anything before, uh, excuse me, if anything better defines the historical vacuum that is the Caps, it's the celebrity lineup announcer Pat Sajak droning on pointlessly about his lifelong fandom, 13 years. Wow, 13 whole years. <laughs> After 20 years as a li- as a self-professed Kings fan, hashtag I'd like you to buy a personality, Pat. Anyways, a hockey game was also played. I'm wow. telling you, Pat Sajak uh, lit up the stratosphere in the social media world after it, that game. It seemed weird to me that, that you know, he was chosen. Um, Cause I, first of all, I had no idea that he was even remotely associated with the caps. Neither did you I know when they, when, when Vegas brought out Michael Buffer, I'm like, yeah, that's Vegas that, yep. you know, he's boxing announcer. Vegas is known for hosting what countless boxing matches over the years to have Michael Buffer. That makes total sense for Vegas. Um, but to roll out Pat Sajak. Now, I didn't expect Washington to do anything special in the game. You know, let's 
take for example, you know, we're gonna let we're gonna let Vegas do what they're gonna do. Um, let's say, for example, the Boston Bruins had made it all the way to the Stanley Cup final. You know what they would have done before that game? They would have ro- they would have rolled out Rene Rancourt once again to to sing the national anthem. They wouldn't have yep. changed a thing that they've done over the years. They're not gonna I, they're not they're not gonna go to those. Um, I, I don't. It's not the right way to say stoop to those levels, but um, what Vegas does with their pregame, that is totally Vegas's thing. That's their, it's, it's, you know, Vegas is known for their over the top show business atmosphere to everything that they do there. To see a team like Washington try to match that would have been awkward no matter what they did. But to yep. bring out Pat Sajak, yep. who I didn't even know lived in Washington, D.C. Turns out he lives in, in, in the area. I didn't know that. Somewhere in Maryland. I just pulled up his Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. It says he currently lives in uh, Maryland. And I forget the, uh, I lost the uh, town. But he's originally from Chicago. Yep. So if he grew up a true hockey fan where he, you know, where he seems to say he's a lifelong hockey fan, being from Chicago originally, wouldn't you think he would have been a, I mean, he's old enough to remember the days of the original six. Wouldn't you think he'd be a Chicago Blackhawks fan? Well, um, and then of course he, he lived in LA for all those years when he was doing, you know, the, the, the wheel of fortune. And, um, he was a, like you said, or like it said in the article up to 13 years ago, he was a Kings fan fan yeah and now he's a capitals fan dude pick a team the way the (laughs) article was written yeah the way the article was written on the nhl.com he is a dual season ticket holder now i may maybe i maybe i'm wrong about that but the way it's written it says he also owns tickets to the los angeles Kings season tickets um, that makes sense because his Wikipedia page does say that he has houses in the dc area and in la yeah which would make sense. He's still doing Wheel of Fortune, right? He, to my knowledge, he still is. Yes. Yeah, and that's taped out there. So, um, so it would make sense that he would have a, a place in both places, right? Because while he's doing Wheel of Fortune, while they're taping those shows, and I'm sure they tape um, many, many weeks, all of, you know, in big chunks. They can, they can tape them. You know, yeah. they can, they can do twenty shows in a week. Yeah. In real time. Right. So he just goes out there to his other house while he's while he's working, and then flies back east when he's not uh, working. So. That right. totally makes sense, but um, and and I would imagine, yeah, being if you know he is obviously a hockey fan, um, having season tickets in both places for a guy like him is not going to be all that expensive. No. Um, but yeah, the, Severna Park, Maryland, is is where it says he lives, and then he also has a second home in L.A. Um, but the, you know the comments that he made, you know, before he announced the starting lineup, were just came across as just ugh. Yeah, because, you know, he's he's talking about yeah, I'm season ticket holder for 13 years. My seats are down by the glass. He says, "Come on down and see me." But good luck getting by my security. I mean, really? Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I did not understand that part of it, but um, then again, I I'm not there in Washington to know what the fully what what's going on it, it is true that there are a lot of dignitaries and i mean you talk about the new york rangers having stars and the los angeles kings going having stars appear at their games yeah there are a lot of stars in the governmental media uh you know there, there's a lot of a lot of famous people attending those capitals games there's there's no it, it's a yeah, fact but the they're president. all they're all politicians they don't want to alienate their their uh constituents by admitting that they're a fan of one team or the other <laughs> right right but i mean the, the, from time to time the president of the united states no matter who he is will go to a capitals game yeah uh, but i don't think he's a hockey fan specifically per se right. he's certainly not like you know he's he, he doesn't come across to me as a sports fan the way uh, Obama was. It was clear he was a diehard basketball guy. Oh yeah, and no doubt you know, he was. A, he was a Bulls fan, of course, because he's from Chicago. But but yeah, basketball was was Obama's thing. I but don't he think wouldn't go to hockey games. Obama would go to hockey games. Um... He would, but you know that would there's there's a with with politicians. I always look for the message behind the message. You know, they're always. He's probably doing it just to try to get a few hockey play or hockey fan votes. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Um, it was it was obvious that you know he loved basketball. He likes sports anyway. Um, but I don't think um, I, it just doesn't come across to me that that Trump is that much of a sports guy. Right. Maybe he is. I don't know. You just never see him talking sports that often. Obama enjoyed talking sports with right. anybody who would talk with him about it. 
Right. You, you don't see that with uh, with the current president. So um, that's why I don't think I think I think um, Trump is a baseball guy, I think, more than anything. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and maybe possibly an NFL guy, but certainly not hockey. But anyway, but yeah, it, I guess in a city like D.C. Beca- in, and of course, politicians are not going to because um, most of the people that are that are high profile jobs or high profile people are actually not originally from D.C. So. You know, you say the senator from, you know, name a state, senator right. from Florida right. were to go to a hockey game and, you know, want to come out and, and, and support the Capitals. Well, all his constituents back home in Florida be like, well, wait a minute. You're from Florida. Why are you cheering for the Caps? Yeah. I, well, well, I the, 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 the media people who cover Washington politics are also at those games. Well, that's For true. Example, I'll, I'll throw out Brett Baer, who is a Capitals fan. Yep. Um, and also shots on Fox's six o'clock broadcast. But so. they can. But they can. They're press. They're, they're not. Yeah. Their jobs aren't aren't secured by votes. <laughs> I agree. I agree. But but you will see those types of people at the games. Yeah, people will recognize. Oh yeah, those. the politicians are. You know, they're all going to the games. Absolutely. But they're not going to. Uh, they're not going to go over the top on their support for one team or another because they don't. You know, they don't want to alienate any voters. Right. Which but, uh, comes I, I, I just thought it was interesting because I followed the fandom of Pat Sajak, as Keith Oberman put it, for a few years now, wondering who he pulls for. I wonder who his team is. Yep. Uh, he really didn't let on during the interviews that I saw at more than one uh, uh, Winter Classic uh, who he pulled for. Right. Uh, and they didn't they didn't bring that up. And, and so when I saw that he was doing the game, uh, the intro game, and then he went on further than that, I'm a season ticket holder of the Washington Capitals. I, uh, I was kind of surprised by that. And uh, uh, I, there's no doubt he's a, he's a big fan, but you're right. He's pulling for multiple teams. Yeah. I think he loves the NHL. I think that's the, that's the major thing. And that's, is, and that's fine. Yeah. You can be a big hockey fan. We're big hockey fans, but we all have our own teams. Right. And, you know, and I, and I get teased by people down here, like, wait, you live down here, but yet you're, you're a Bruins fan. Why, why aren't you going to, when are you going to change is, is the question I get. When are you going to finally become a Carolina Hurricanes fan? And every time my answer is never. I mean, yes, I want to see them succeed, but my allegiance is with the team that I grew up loving and that Will not change. Right, right. I just, I just don't see a circumstance where that would change, unless, um, you know, the team is completely mismanaged, and I absolutely hate the owner, and decide to change teams because I don't want to support a certain owner. But um, <laughs> I've had plenty of opportunity to feel that way. Believe me, with the with the Bruins' current owner. But no, I still, still have my favorite team, and I don't expect that to change. So, right. But uh, Pat Sajak, he seems to have many teams right now. It's the Capitals because they're in it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that is it. That was a good story. That's it. Thank you. All right. So we are done for tonight. We are finished. We're through. We somehow managed to take a quiet week that hasn't had a lot of news and turn it into a full-length deal. <laughs> yes, we did. A lot of good stories on this the, the show this week. Yep. And uh, I certainly enjoyed it. So. Yep. Well, good. Well, we'll go ahead and end it for this week. Um, as for the, uh, the, the next few weeks i haven't quite figured out what i'm going to do obviously we only have um i guess a lot will depend on what happens here in the remainder of the um uh stanley cup finals if uh if this series does drag out obviously i'll we'll have a show next week but um um if it ends tonight i may wait a couple of weeks and take a breather between now and and the next show so um so stay tuned for that but uh if you don't hear from us for or, for uh, for a couple of weeks, if the series ends quickly tonight and you don't hear from us for a week or two, then uh, just know we're not going anywhere, just taking a bit of a break because it's been a long season. We haven't missed many episodes this this week and we're, uh, we you know, it's break time because we are right after the, the um, we got the draft coming up, so we'll have full coverage of that. We've got free agency, we'll have full coverage of that. And then this summer will probably be very quiet. I may actually um, take a break from it this summer because... Um, I've got big plans for vacations this summer and I'm going to be out of town a lot. So, um, so there won't be a lot of time to do podcasts <laughs> for me anyway, this summer. <laughs> so, and we've got to, we've got to kind of sit back and reorganize here a little bit in the, during the summertime as we head into next season. So, um, as you know, Steve's going to be part-time going forward and, uh, I've got to uh, come up with a bunch of new hosts. So I've got some, uh, people that have shown interest and, 
I got to get with them and and you know get the ball rolling with those folks, and then uh, we'll, we'll we'll get things going. But in the meantime, um, shows may or may not be sporadic. We'll see, and then we'll uh, take things from there. And you have anything you you wanted to add before we kill it? Uh, no, other than I really uh, I've really enjoyed it. As I said last week, I'm going to miss this. I look forward to uh, to coming back on one uh, once or or so once or twice uh, in the near. Uh, see, probably next season uh, to, a, as you see fit, to uh, to add my uh, two cents worth, so to speak. But it's been a it's been an incredible thing for me to do. Um, as I said, I uh, I never in, a, in my wildest dreams would have thought that this uh, podcast and doing a podcast on hockey would have had such a profound effect on my life. But it has, and I've enjoyed it, and I will miss it. It's been great working with you. It makes it all the more better, Wayne, that you are such a huge hockey fan um, because we get to talk about things that really matter to us, you know, yep. and uh, that makes a big difference. So, Well, at the very least, I'll be looking to you for sure on the big Rangers-related stories. Even even if you just come on for about a 10-minute segment where we talk about the big Ranger stories, that, that's, uh, that'll be enough for me. So uh, That's good. <laughs> I'll be glad to do it. So. So, because I know, even though you won't be doing a podcast um, and following all the teams as much as as you have been uh, the past couple of seasons, you'll certainly be following your Rangers. So, um, you'll probably know more about what's going on with the Rangers than I certainly will, because <laughs> I don't watch them as close as you do. So, well, there, there's reason to be very, uh, very. Um... Uh, happy and looking forward to the future. If you're a New York Rangers fan with a new coach, a new outlook, uh, a, a big draft coming up with a lot of potential. Uh, so uh, yeah, I look, f- I, that's a great, uh, great thing. I want to have me on talk about Rangers. I'll be glad to do it. Yep. Well, what, what I'll probably do to start with is just have you come on at some point this summer and we can, we can record it away from the podcast and I can insert it in as, as a segment where you and I just come on for about 15, 20 minutes after the draft sometime and talk about how the Rangers did in the draft. That sounds good. And yeah. we, can, we can take it from there. So, All right, well, let's go ahead and end it for this week because uh, I'm hungry. I want to go have dinner before we, have, <laughs> before we watch some hockey tonight. So, and, I know, <laughs> and I know you're agreeing with me. So let's go ahead and wrap it up for tonight. And until next time, we'll talk to you then. Have a good week, Steve. So long, Wayne. Good All work. Right. Have a good night. You too. Well, there you have it. If you like the show, please show us your support by subscribing to it using your favorite podcatcher program or app. The Hockey Nuts podcast can be found on major podcast search engines like Apple Podcasts and Google Play Music. Just search for the term The Hockey Nuts in whatever app you use to get podcasts. We can also be found at thehockeywriters.com on their podcast page. Thehockeywriters.com is a great place to get more stories and content about our favorite sport. We love listener involvement, and there are a few ways you can get involved with the show. You can email the show at feedback at thehockeynuts.com, or you can leave us a voicemail in our mailbox at 919-960-1718. You can also tweet us. I'm at WayneHalley9. Steve is at SBall504Man. Also, be sure to visit our website at thehockeynuts.com. There you can see all of our past episodes archived, and you can listen to the show through your web browser on that site. As always, links and stories that we mention in the show are available in the show notes for this episode. In addition to our website, you can also watch us record the show each week live on YouTube. We generally record on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday nights, depending on our work schedules. You can find our YouTube channel at thehockeynuts.com slash YouTube. The show is a labor of love for us, but the production of it is not free. To help us offset the cost of producing the show, we set up various affiliate links on our webpage at thehockeynuts.com. Affiliate links allow you to help us financially support our podcast without costing you any more money out of pocket. Some of the affiliate relationships we have are with Amazon, HockeyMonkey.com, Ting.com, and SeatGeek.com. If you use any of these services, we'd greatly appreciate it if you used our affiliate link to those sites. Simply go to thehockeynuts.com and click on the appropriate advertising banner on the right. Your purchase will not cost you anything extra and a small portion of your purchase will come back to help support the show. Finally, we're also looking for a future guest for the show. 
Obviously, we're not experts on every team in league and hockey, so if you consider yourself more knowledgeable than us on a particular team or league, we definitely want to hear from you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Hockey Nuts Podcast, and have a great rest of your day.